27. We started this last time and I want to come back to it. We got down to verse 20. And so my text in this message will be from verse 21 down to verse 31. I want to speak with you about blessing and cursing. We're not talking about cursing as in swearing, but what it is to be blessed and what it is to be cursed. In reality, you can take all of the population of the world all the way down through history, and every one who has ever been born in this world has been born under one of those two categories, either blessed or cursed. And so you say, well, what makes the difference? Well, we're going to find out here in this particular portion. My text is from verse 21, but I'd like to begin with verse 18 to give us the context where it says, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Now, we know that there is no sinner in himself that could ever say he is upright. We're all sinners by nature. But first of all, when you speak of the upright one, which is one way of reading that, you could put in there that this is a scripture portion concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord, we know he is God, Christ is, but Father, Son, and Spirit knoweth the days of the upright one. He who came into this world to establish righteousness on behalf of a people, and he knoweth those days. He knows exactly, even as David was writing it here, he was looking forward to that time where God had promised him a seed that should come. Because in him then, the upright one, it says their inheritance shall be forever. So the only way that any sinner could ever be considered to be upright, or as we're going to see, blessed, is in the upright one, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in that way, the Lord does know not only the upright, those that he has chosen by his grace for whom Christ came and worked out their salvation. It says their inheritance shall be forever. Well, I've learned to ask the question this way, not what is our inheritance, but who is our inheritance? Who is the inheritance of those for whom Christ died? We know what Christ said to the thief on the cross. There was certainly no uprightness in him. And yet, it was for him that the Lord was paying the sin debt. And when he was caused to cry out to the Lord to remember him, when he came in his kingdom, what did the Lord say to him? Today, you shall be with me in paradise. That was the inheritance of that thief on the cross, and he is the inheritance of every one of those for whom he paid the sin debt. And so the Lord knows the days of the upright. We don't know. We can't even say one nanosecond from now what's going to take place, but the Lord does because he purposes our steps. So that's in the context where we begin to see this theme coming through. Who are the blessed ones? And who are the cursed ones? Verse 19, verse 19 says, They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. What it tells us there is that those that are the Lord's are going to know evil times. The Lord even purposes those times. In Isaiah, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 45, I am God, I create good and I create evil. When he says evil, he's talking about everything that we might consider to be evil that's unsettling in our world, and yet God has ordained it and appointed it. Even in the days of famine, it says they shall be satisfied. 
Where do we look in such days of distress for the Lord? We look to him because all things come from his hand. Just like those little puppies that the Lord Jesus Christ said, sit at the feet of the master's table waiting for crumbs to fall from his table. He is our satisfaction. So that's already a description of what it is to be blessed. Paul wrote about it in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but don't leave the last part off, in Christ Jesus. That's the only place where there's true blessing. People can have temporal blessings. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, but those are temporal. And we're talking here about true blessings, where it says in verse 18, their inheritance shall be forever because Christ is forever. So that's the blessedness of being Christ's. But here's the contrast now in verse 20, where we get into what it is to be cursed. Here it says, the wicked shall perish. So here you have those that are considered to be upright. And then you've got those that are called wicked. So how is it that any sinner can be called upright? Only by the imputation of Christ's work on their behalf. All the rest are described in scripture as the wicked. You see this particularly here in this psalm and throughout other psalms, but through the book of Proverbs, really throughout all of Scripture. When you see that term, the wicked, it's always connected with perishing. When it talks about perishing, that means they're now perishing because they are without that life that only comes in Christ, and they shall perish forever what is perishing but to be destroyed and separated forever from any hope of blessing in Christ. And they're called here the enemies of the Lord, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. It's using a metaphor there of the sacrificing of these lambs, but here instead of lambs being sacrificed on behalf of sinners as it is in Christ, these themselves are the sacrifice. If Christ has not borne the wrath of God for a sinner, then that sinner will bear forever the wrath of God. And it says here, they shall consume into smoke shall they consume away. Christ spoke of it as being a place where the worm dies not. In other words, that these will continue to exist even beyond this life, but under God's condemnation, it'll be eternal wrath. So there's the two descriptions there of what it is to be blessed and what it is to be cursed. And now we come to the portion that I want us to consider here in verse 21 down to verse 31. Verse 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. So you might look at that and say, well, why that particular illustration concerning a wicked that borrows and pays not again? Well, it's talking about what a wicked person is in their nature. They might give the impression when they're borrowing that somehow they're always going to honor what they have said, but in reality, to be wicked means to be a liar. And that's really what we all are before God. Christ even said that of the Pharisees, that you are of your father the devil. Even though they were religious outwardly, yet he knew their heart and said they were of their father the devil, who was a murderer and what? A liar from the beginning. That's because that's who Satan is. He deceived Adam and Eve. He's a liar from the beginning. And so here it's describing particularly those that left to themselves. They don't have Christ as their ransom. They don't have Christ as their substitute. They don't have Christ as their righteousness. 
They only think of themselves. When you think of a person who borrows and never had in borrowing the intention of paying again, we've all run into those people. They tell a good story and they let you know, hey, if you could just give me this for just a few days, I'll be right back here to pay for it. And the next thing you know, you never see them again. So it's characterizing, even as up in the previous verses, describing who are the wicked, who are these that are cursed. They have an evil nature, and their intention is never to do good for others. They're only self-seeking, they're self-willed. All of this can be connected to one who borrows and does not repay. I think about it even in the terms of spiritually, how the Lord gives temporally to all people things that pertain to their life and their sustenance, their breath, and yet it is only a borrowing, if you will, because nobody ever really owns what they have. I know we talk about our houses, we talk about our cars, we talk about our kids, but in reality, all these things are lent to us. And so who is a wicked one who is cursed, but that in borrowing, even from the Lord, does not give him the glory? They think that somehow all of these things are theirs, and nor will they ever give the glory. When it says does not repay, and I know this, we all have a great debt before God in our sinfulness that we could never repay. And so left to ourselves, all of us would have to be described as these wicked who are takers and receiving from God's hand and yet never repaying in the sense of giving him back the glory for it. I dare say that every time we partake of our food or Whenever we get up in the morning, our thought ought to be to thank the Lord again for his blessings. We sing that hymn, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Well, it's a way for those of us that are the Lord's to give back to him. We could never repay what he gives us, but giving back the glory for all things. But that never crosses a wicked person's mind. And we're talking even about religious people here where they do what they do to be seen of men rather than the glory of God. But in contrast, again, we're looking at blessing and cursing. That's who's cursed. The blessed, as described here, as the righteous, it says the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Again, when it talks about the righteous, the only ones that could be declared righteous are those that God looks upon as righteous because of the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And where God has been pleased to do that work of grace in their heart, having shown them mercy, they are merciful. Having been objects of God's grace, they're in that spirit of Christ being in them their desire is to give wherever the Lord so directs. And so you see this contrast here between those that are blessed and those that are cursed. And so in verse 22, for such, here it is, here's the word, as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. None of this is by merit. If any one of us can be described as one of these upright whose inheritance is Christ himself, it's because, as verse 22 says, such as be blessed of him. There's the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. When Peter declared, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, when Christ asked him, well, who do, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ said to him, Simon Bar-Jonas, that was his name, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but what my father, which is in heaven, blessed are you. So that's the blessing that we see here. 
but the blessing is of the Lord, such as be blessed of him. I'll tell you, where God blesses, none can take away. And it's certainly not merited. Notice what word is used there in verse 22, just like up in verse 18, when it says their inheritance shall be forever. It doesn't say their merit shall be forever. That's what grace does. It gives and it's an inheritance. Here it says, for such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. This was a term that you're going to find throughout the Old Testament. But the earth that it's talking about is not this physical earth. There's nothing to enjoy about this fallen earth. But when it says, shall inherit the earth, this is the hope that every child of God has for whom Christ has paid their sin debt that there will be that new heaven and new earth scripture speaks of this earth being purged and burnt up and that the eternal dwelling then of those that are the Lord's will be in this new heaven and new earth the new heavens and the new earth are ultimately the culmination of the story of God's saving work that began all the way back there in the garden in Genesis 3 and verse 15, where God promised that there would be a seed of the woman that would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. That's speaking of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of this foreshadowed then, just like there was that garden that was created before the fall, the end of the story. People laugh at me because I tell them I always like to read the last chapter of a book first to see how it's going to end and then go back and see how it all worked out. People are like, you can't do that. Well, that's just the way I am. I, wanna, I don't like to be in reading wondering, well, how is this thing going to end? Well, thankfully, we know how it's going to end because we have this written in Scripture. The scriptures clearly talk about that eternal dwelling place. So when it says here, such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. There's nothing about this earth really that is of any lasting attraction for us because it's under the curse. But oh, the blessedness. Again, what's the new heaven and new earth about? It's all about Christ dwelling with him forever. And if you look over in Revelation chapter 20, here's where I say read the last part of the book and you'll see what is the hope of those who are blessed as described here. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning with verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne. The white throne represents God's holiness and justice. And him that sat on it, who is seated on that throne other than the Lord Jesus Christ and from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. That's talking about this earth and this world as we know it. And it says there was no, found no place for them. That means that this will be ultimately the result of Christ's redemption that everything about this sin-cursed earth and world and universe, there will be no place found for it when uh, this work is complete. And notice I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. When he talks about the dead being judged out of those things which were written in the books, it's referring to the books of men's works. And notice it doesn't say there that they'll be saved out of those things which are written in those books according to their works, but what? Judged. There's only one place you want to have your name and that's going to be in the book of life. 
How does one have their name in the book of life? Again, it comes back to being blessed of God, having been chosen of him, and Christ being that lamb slain. But all others in those books, books of works, a lot of people boast of their works. They think that somehow when they get there, if their good works outweigh the bad, then they'll be okay. No. Unless your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, there's no hope. There's nothing but condemnation. And that's who David is writing about, those that will perish, the wicked that perish. It's because no amount of works could ever satisfy God's holiness and justice. But here it says, The sea, verse 13, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were, what? Judged every man according to their works. So here again we see the blessing and cursing. The curse is that every single person since Adam, who does not have Christ as their ransom, will be judged according to their works. And uh, there can only be condemnation because all of our righteousnesses, even our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. But look at verse 15. So we've been speaking here about the books according to their works, but then this one book, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the inheritance the, that is that of those for whom Christ has paid the debt is described as then entering into this new heaven and new earth as you see in Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven. And a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And you can continue to read on down through there. So this is the hope of those coming back here that are blessed of him. What is it to be blessed of him? It means that God did the choosing. It's not us choosing him. He's the one that chose those that he would bless. And it means that Christ has paid their sin debt. Here it was forward-looking to that time, David, when Christ would come, but now we look back and see that he has come, and they're blessed in that the Spirit of God has called them out, revealed themselves to be sinners, and yet given eyes to look to Christ alone. But all others, as it says there in verse 22, shall be cut off. They that be cursed of him. Notice those words, it's important. Be blessed of him, that's to be in Christ, but they that be cursed of him. I hear preachers saying all the time, well, God really doesn't want to send sinners to hell, but he, he does if he has to. No, here very clearly, the blessing is of the Lord and the cursing is of the Lord. They that be cursed of him, what is their end? They shall be cut off. And that term to be cut off, is an expression that they have no hope and they are without help. They are without grace. Grace is specific to those that God has purposed to bless. But that's where we render back to God all the glory because we recognize that unless God had been pleased to be merciful to such as we are in Christ, then our place would certainly be among these wicked men whose end is to be cut off. So that's the first thing that we note here with regard to God's blessing. The blessing is of him and the cursing is of him. But secondly, here in verses 23 and 24, we see the blessing of God's guidance in Christ versus those that are not in Christ, those that are cursed. What is the blessing of those that are in Christ? Here it says in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. 
Now we know there the word good, as I've said before in English, it comes from the word God. It's a derivative of the word God. There's none good but God. And so the steps of a God man, one that God has been pleased to reveal Christ in, they're ordered by the Lord. Christ himself said that no man can come unto me except it be given him of my Father. And we know that those that are the Lord's, their steps have been ordered of the Lord from eternity. Stop and think about that. If I'm in Christ today, it's because God purposed it even before I knew him. And it says, he delighteth in his way. You could read that and say, well, the good man delighteth in the way of God. But, again, this is all flowing from God down to that man that God has purposed to bless in his grace. And God delights in his way. We know ourselves to be sinners. And yet, because Christ has paid the sin debt, There's not one sin for which God now is going to cast off any one of his own because it's the Lord ordering the steps. And it says there in verse 20, though he fall, we fall every day. We're not talking about just physically falling. We're talking about spiritually. For what sin will God ever cast off one of his own? When you stop and think about it, when God chose those that he would save, They were sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When the Spirit calls one of these, it's out of sin and darkness. So my question has always been, then for what sin will he ever cast off one of his own? It's because of their sin that God has purposed to show grace. You can't talk about grace without talking about sin. But here's the blessing. Again, this is what it is to be blessed of God. In that in every step and in every way, the Lord upholds. You see that in verse 24? For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Any that have been put into Christ's hand, he'll never lose them. If salvation depended in any part on man, you'd have to say, well, then there's no hope. But it's not. Salvation is God having chosen sinners and put them in Christ's hand. Christ is that first elect, and then sinners elect in him. But he's not going to lose one for whom he came into this world. Christ said that. Of all that the Father has given me, John 6, I'll not lose, I'll lose nothing, but shall raise him up in the last day. Oh, the blessedness of being what's described here is that good man. We know there's no goodness in us. But where God has declared sinners to be righteous for Christ's sake, what a blessing and what a peace knowing that there's nothing that I can do that could ever undo, either by way of my sin or by way of of my steps and what I think are are good steps. None of that changes at all who I am in Christ. And of course, we know that the one good man that came to this earth, his steps were ordered by the Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And God the Father delighted certainly in Christ's way because twice while he was on the earth that voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and so why are we blessed if we're in Christ it's because he's the blessed man he's the good man and he was upheld he never fell but he was certainly tried and tempted and tested in every way and yet he was upheld all the way from his conception to the cross and into glory because he was God's representative that God purposed should come and pay the sin debt of his people. What a blessing to be one of those that the Lord 
has been pleased to deliver in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But thirdly, here in verses 25 and 26, to be a blessed man is to be one who is after God's own heart. It doesn't mean that we're after God's heart, but we're the object of God's heart. Here it says in verse 25 and 26, I have been young and now I'm old. So David is writing this in his latter years. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken. So again, when you see righteous, it's, it's righteous by imputation in Christ, not anything in us. But I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. So this is what it is to be, again, blessed of God. This is the testimony of God concerning those that are his, because God cares for every one of his own. David's writing this testimony after many years, but he's declaring God's faithfulness, not only to himself, but to his people. And here he's teaching the next generation of God's faithfulness. I believe that's what we do if we're the Lord's. And as we age, we talk of God's faithfulness, not ours, but God's, to those that the Lord is raising up behind us. And we can testify... <clears throat> with a certainty that the Lord has never forsaken any of his own, that he upholds them and keeps them. Now, some might argue and say, well, there are certainly times when we've had to help some of the Lord's children and uh, in their time of need provide bread for them. And certainly there have been those that have been destitute as the writer to the Hebrews speaks of there because of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the key there is never forsaken. That even in the worst of situations, this is what it is to be blessed. It doesn't mean that we're going to be devoid of trials and afflictions and temptations and persecutions and suffering. No, we're, we're going to know these things, but never forsaken. To the point where it says his seed is found begging bread other than begging for Christ who is the bread. And that's the promise that we see here for those that are blessed of the Lord. And as verse 26 says, he's ever merciful in lens. Now this could be looking at it from the standpoint of God being ever merciful and continuing to give because remember everything he gives in this life is borrowed we're going to leave it here and yet in his mercy his seed is blessed continues to be blessed in Christ but as we see those that are objects of mercy if we know how the Lord has been merciful to us then we're going to be merciful. And I believe that is in connection with never seeing the seed begging bread. The Lord is always going to provide for his own through the hand of other members of his body caring for them because the Lord, as he's been merciful, so those to whom he has shown that mercy are merciful. Paul, in the 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you look over there with me. In the first century, it was actually the Jewish believers who were suffering persecution in Jerusalem. And Paul was an apostle of the Gentiles. And wherever he went to preach the gospel, he encouraged the Gentiles, those that were the believers, to gather up according as the Lord had prospered them and to send this down to Jerusalem. That was unheard of because Jew and Gentile in the world were enemies. And yet in Christ, they were brought together as one 
And so here were these Gentiles now, wherever Paul went to preach, gathering as the Lord directed and giving so that this gift could be taken down to the believers in Jerusalem. And you might think, well, they must have been really rich. And so they were giving out of the abundance of their riches. You know, just whatever's extra, we're going to give. But that's not what we read here. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2, it says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and what? And their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. They were giving because they knew how the Lord had been merciful to them. And hearing of the need of others of the body of Christ, they weren't commanded or obligated. No, the, the very mercy of God is what caused them to desire to give. And that's what we see here in Psalm 37, verse 26. Because he is ever merciful and giveth, lendeth in that sense. We constantly benefit from the mercies of God. So it is we take of what we've received and we give unto those that are of the household of faith. That's just the characteristic of ones that are blessed in Christ. But let's come back here to my text in Psalm 37. Here we see the command given in verses 27 to 29. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. There again, it's not anything holy in us, but those to whom that very righteousness of Christ has been imputed, they are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. So again, the comparison or contrast between what it is to be blessed and what it is to be cursed. Those that are blessed of the Lord are never forsaken. The Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. When it says the Lord loveth judgment, that's forward looking. That word means justice. So what it's saying is if Christ has paid the debt of a sinner, God is faithful to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I say that those that preach that Christ died for every single person in the world, they make God to be unjust then. Because if you say Christ paid their debt and yet they end up in hell anyway, that makes God unjust. That would be double jeopardy. Christ paid the debt and yet they still are punished. No, the death of Christ is particular to these that God has purposed to bless. And it, because he loveth judgment, that should be a comfort to any of us for whom Christ paid the debt. God will not change. He's not an unjust judge. When Christ paid the debt, it was paid. And notice, forsaketh not his saints. So that's the foundation then for us in verse 27, being of this number, to depart from evil. When the scriptures talk about departing from evil, it means to depart from any way, seeking any other way than Christ as our hope. Christ is our assurance. Depart from that way. And when it says to do good, it's not talking about doing good works. There again, the word good is a derivative of the word God. Do as God has declared and dwell forevermore. Well, what has God declared? To believe on his son, rest in his son, abide in him, trust in his finished work alone. That's what it is to, to depart from evil is to, to never seek any other way in our own works or our own will. Anything that we think might contribute, that's an evil way. You know, to do good, it's like the Lord told Cain when the Lord had refused his sacrifice. If you look back in Genesis chapter 4, you know, why did God accept Abel and refuse Cain? Well, it had everything to do with the sacrifice. A lot of people think, well, Cain had a bad attitude, and that's why God refused him. No, when you read the scriptures, it says there in 
Genesis 4 and verse 5, unto Cain and to his, what, offering, he had not respect. Those that think they can come before God with their works as being the reason why God should accept them, they're under the curse. That's why the Lord rejected Cain. He came with the best fruit. He was a farmer. I'm sure he didn't come with any rotten fruit, but turnips don't bleed. Abel was accepted because he came as God had taught Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, they covered themselves with fig leaves, but God removed those fig leaves and slew some innocent animals that blood shed and then clothed them. That's a picture of the work of Christ. And that's how he continued to come. But you can see here in Genesis 4 and verse 7, the Lord told Cain, well, in verse 6, why art thou wroth? He was angry at God. He should have been angry at himself. Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, that's that word good. Well, what was he telling Cain to do? Go back and clean up the fruit some more and come back? No. To do well would be for Cain then to go and take a, an animal sacrifice and to bring that blood before the Lord. He said, if thou doest well, if you come in the way that God has declared that sinners should be saved through the blood sacrifice of his son, shalt thou not be accepted? That's the term that Paul uses of those that are in Christ, accepted in the beloved. Not just made acceptable, but accepted in the blood. Beloved. But he says, if thou doest not well, if you do not do as God has declared in coming in that way, what does he say? Sin lieth at the door. That means that there's no forgiveness of sin apart from the blood sacrifice. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So that's the sense coming back here to my text, to depart from evil and do good. It means to reject any other way of coming to God except through his son. And uh, doing good, what is the will of God? It's to believe on his son and to hear him and rest in him. Those that are blessed of him, that's what they do. And that's why they're accepted, because of the work of Christ. But any other way is a way of condemnation. And that's what he says there. But the seed of the wicked, verse 28, shall be cut off. It doesn't matter how long. A wicked person lives in this world, if they're not in Christ, eventually they will be cut off forever. And then, verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and shall dwell therein forever. You see again that expression used three times in this portion. Christ said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Well, what is it to be meek? It means to be bowed to Christ. And to inherit the earth is to receive the blessings of God's promise in Christ. That's a metaphor of what it is to be truly blessed in Christ. And then verse 30 and 31, to wrap it up for this time, it says, The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. I believe this comes back to Christ again who is the righteous one, who is wisdom. In him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, that's none other than Christ. And his tongue talketh of judgment. If we want to know how it is that God judges sinners and declares some righteous and condemns others, it's going to be through the word of Christ. The law of his God is in his heart. That means that when Christ came, he he came to satisfy the law. It wasn't just in word and deed, but thought. That's where we fail. But none of his steps shall slide. And uh, if we have any hope at all, it's going to be because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us are righteous in ourselves. None of us can say that we have satisfied the law, but he has. And so we look to him. We look to his word. The mouth of the righteous one speaketh wisdom.
everything that Christ has to say to sinners is the revelation of God's wisdom, how he can be just and justify. And his tongue talks of judgment. It's the truth. And the law of his God is in his heart. Thankfully so, because where God, the Son, has satisfied that law and justice of God, there is salvation, and none of his steps shall slide. All right, we're going to leave it there for now, and pray the Lord bless the word as we've heard it. <laughs>